Well, hello, welcome to our continuing teaching through the Gospel of Luke. We're now in Luke chapter 3, and we're going to be picking it up as we now move into the early stages of what will lead to the early stages of the ministry, the adult ministry of Jesus. So we're about 20 years advanced into the future beyond uh, the events in uh, some of the events in chapter 2. So having said that, let's go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll jump in at verse 1. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to teach your word, but I recognize that I need your equipping, your enabling uh, to be fruitful, to be effective, to bring honor to you and help to your people. And that's my prayer. Uh, bless this time, Lord, that your name is honored and your people are helped and lives are changed and spirits are encouraged and, and you are glorified in it all. I pray that and commit this time now into you in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 tells us this, chapter 3 of Luke, verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Aturiae, and Trachonitis and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood, of Anna and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, uh, in the wilderness. So he establishes, Luke was a historian, he establishes the historical time frame. I'm not going to go into all these different names. We can get lost in that and kind of miss the, as the old saying goes, miss the forest for the trees. But what's most important here is, is God is now intervening in history in a way that really hasn't happened in about 400 years. There's been a silence. There's been no prophets. Uh, there's been no official spokesman for God. They've had the written word of God, but they've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for God to answer their prayers. They've been waiting for God to intervene. And now 400 years, uh, after 400 years of silence, that is happening. And that's what it means at the end of verse 2, where it says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. You may remember that John was a born a special that God had already called him out early even before his conception for the ministry and the purpose that he had for him and here we see that John is in the wilderness and this was pretty typical of John he lived in the wilderness he ate a very uh, I don't know what the right word would be but not a high class diet he didn't wear high class clothes he wasn't you know he didn't have a luxury chariot but rather he he was living in a way that reflected the ministry that he had because many of the religious leaders of the day were um, using religion to enrich themselves and and they were they had kind of lost the respect of those around them because of the excesses the indulgences the financial excesses that they live but John comes and he's different he's not making money off this deal He's not getting rich. His needs are provided for, but there's not much beyond that. He's, he's eating locusts and honey. He's, he's wearing uh, 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 clothing, secondhand clothing. He's living in the wilderness. And then we see in verse 3, uh, the beginning of, of his ministry, what God has called him to, it says there in verse 3, And he went into all the region around Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of since. So John's primary ministry was to call the, the Jewish people to repentance and to be baptized, to be immersed in water as a sign of that repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now that's actually an astounding thing that we could easily look past, and I don't want us to, because the in that day, many of the religious people and some of the everyday Jews were kind of taught to think of themselves as superior morally and spiritually. They were the clean people. They were the righteous people. They were the holy people. They were God's favors. They were on God's good side. Uh, they had all the blessings of God. And so here comes John telling people, you need to get baptized, which is the equivalent of telling people, you're dirty and you need a bath, but on a spiritual and a moral level. And the purpose of this particular baptism, this, the outward ceremony, was to acknowledge we need to turn from our sins. We need, we, we're not living righteously. 
we've done wrong and we need forgiveness of our sins. So sometimes this is a reminder that many times the people who are the most religious, who are the most active in spiritual activities are the very people who need to be confronted and, and be told, you are living wrongly. You need to repent. You need to be forgiven. And then we're told in verse 4 a description from the Old Testament that was a foretelling or a foreshadowing of John's ministry. That's why it tells us in verse 4, <clears throat> as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice <clears throat> of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and all the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all the flesh shall see the salvation of God. So these are prophecies from the book of Isaiah, uh, that you know most of them are Isaiah chapter 40, if memory serves me uh, correctly. And the whole idea here is God has already said, um, before I send the Messiah, I'm going to send somebody to kind of make way. Because it, and, and there's a picture here that we could easily not see. In ancient times, when they knew that a king was coming, the announcement was made, a king is coming, and they knew the time frame that that king might be coming very, very soon, they would begin to make way for that king. They would go out onto the roads, and the roads were not like roads of our day. They were often filled with potholes and stones and you know valleys and dips and, and not really fit for a king. They weren't level. And so the idea here is, the king is coming, we need to get ready, and he's taken that idea from the political realm, and he's applying it on a spiritual level, and he's saying the purpose that John the Baptist has is that the king is coming, that king is Jesus, therefore we need to get ready. There, there's, some, there's some brokenness, there's some, there's some stony places, there's some unlevel places, there's some crooked places, there's some rough places. And of course, he's not talking about outward things. He's not talking about physical things. He's talking about the condition of our hearts. And so John the Baptist, in some ways, is pointing people to their need to get right with God in order to be ready to meet the king. And in some ways, we have that same ministry as John the Baptist. We're also telling people, the king has come. Jesus has arrived, and he's coming back, and you need to get ready and part of that call is to call people to repentance from their sins. And that's exactly what John the Baptist does. And that was his primary ministry. <clears throat> and you'll see that not only we saw that in verse 3, but we see that also in verse 7, where John responds to those who are being baptized, <laughs> but not necessarily for the right reasons, not with the right heart. So he says in verse 7, he said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able from these very stones to raise up children for Abraham. So, it seems odd that here people come and they respond to the message. You know, he gives the altar call, let's figuratively speaking, and people are just rushing to get baptized. And instead of just encouraging that, John says, time out. Stop. And it says, he says to the crowds, according to verse 7, who were coming to be baptized, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, you poisonous people. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, what's this about? Well, we do happen to know that this was not something he spoke to everyone. We know from the book of Matthew, we know from other texts, that when it says he said to the crowds, he meant the crowd of the, the religious Pharisees. You see, John was popular, and they wanted to get in on this popular thing. And so they're coming, they're saying, okay, everybody's getting dipped in the water. We'll get dipped in the water. We'll be part of this popular move. We want to fit in. But here's the problem. There's no repentance. There's no change. They're just going through the religious motions. Uh, it, it's no different than today when, whenever pastors might have an altar call and, and, and people see that everyone around them is going to the altar. They say, okay, I'll go too. But there's no change in heart. 
And so John says to them, you, you outwardly, you're proclaiming repentance, but inwardly, you're vipers, you're poisonous. You're not, you, you don't, you know, you're, you're trying to get your ticket to heaven, but you're trying to do so without repentance. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why aren't you repenting? And that's why he says in verse 8, <coughs> bear fruits in keeping with repentance. You see, repentance, for those who don't know, repentance means a change of mind that results in a change of direction, behavior, or attitude. Let me say that again. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of uh, behavior, attitude, or direction. You know, so if I'm in a store and I think that the produce is on the left-hand side of the store, in the very corner of the store, and I'm headed in that direction, and suddenly I become aware that the produce is actually at the front of the store on the right-hand side, if I repent, I don't just have a change of mind, but I also change my direction. I turn my cart around, and I head in a different way. Now, that's, you know, not using moral, spiritual issues, but that gets the point across. And that's what the Bible talks about in repentance. You can't just repent and say, oh, I'm sorry for my sins. I really uh, regret what I've done, but I'm going to keep on doing it. I'm going to keep on living this way. Bear fruits. Life change in keeping with repentance. Don't just go through the motions. People do that all the time. I've had people uh, in, in the ministry that I have tell me I'm committing my life to Christ. I want to be a Christian. I want to say the sinner's prayer. I want to go through this. But then I begin to talk to them, talk to them and they still intend to fool around sexually. They still intend to continue to watch pornography. They still intend to get drunk on the weekends, but now they want to add Christ to their life. That's not how it works. You must bear fruit that shows that your repentance is real. And then John addresses a problem that they had and why they weren't truly repenting is they had this false sense of spiritual security. That's why he says in verse 8, the second part of verse 8, don't say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Because basically they would say, I ain't worried about that. I'm not worried about the wrath to come. I'm not worried about repentance. I'm a Jew. I'm a biological descendant of Abraham. I've got this. I'm kind of in by nature. Nothing bad can happen to me. And there are people today who have that same kind of false spiritual security. Maybe not be based on the same reason, but somehow, some way, they're convinced I said the prayer, I'm a member of the church, my, my dad's a pastor, whatever the case may be, but they think that somehow they themselves do not have to personally trust in God, trust in Jesus, and repent of their sins, and they have a false uh, illusion of spiritual security. It's not legitimate. And instead of reassuring them and comforting them, he warns them in verse 9. Even now, he says, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he said, you think you're spiritually safe. He goes, but no, the axe is at the root of the tree. And he's using the illustration as if you're the tree, and what they would do with trees that didn't bear fruit, you know, they'd wait a little bit, they'd keep waiting, but at some point, a farmer who has a tree that's being given fertilizer and water and is being tended to that doesn't bear fruit, the farmer gets his ass out, and now he's saying, you're so close to judgment, it's like the farmer who has the ass at the fruitless tree. You're, you're, you're ready to be cut down and thrown into the fire. So instead of giving them spiritual comfort and a sense of spiritual safety, he gives them a sense of spiritual urgency. You don't have time to play games with God. You need to get right right now. And I think that's something that we need to do. You know, we need to, to, to get out the message out to the world. This is no time to play games. This is no time to take your time. You need to get right with God. You don't know how close you may be to judgment. The ash may be laid at the fruit, at the root of the fruitless tree. Now, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, pretty much dismissed John, didn't agree with John, and would have attacked him if the crowd would have let, let them. So they really didn't respond to John's warnings as true as they were. But the crowd did. They're taking John's words seriously. And you see that in verse 10 where they say this. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. 
Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. And then soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. And so what he's saying here to each group, he's saying, In the area where you've been doing wrong, either neglecting the needy, uh, you've been uh, stealing uh, and oppressing people, or you've been abusing your power like the soldiers were, whatever area you've been doing wrong, he says, well, just start doing right. That's the thing. You see, it's not complicated. Stop doing the wrong thing. Start doing the right thing. That's what repentance is. Stop doing the wrong thing. Start doing the right thing. Uh, people try to make it way more complicated than it needs to be. If you've been lying, start telling the truth. If you've been overcharging, start charging people fairly. Uh, if you've been cheating people, stop cheating people. Uh, if you've been sleeping around, stop sleeping around. That's what repentance is. It's bearing fruit. The fruit is simply a, a lifestyle change that is in accordance with and in conformity with the Word of God. That leads us to verse 15. It says, As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, what, you know, the people understood because they understood the Old Testament. They knew that God had promised this king, this Christ, this anointed one who would usher in the kingdom of God, who would bring people into uh, all the blessings of God. He was called the Christ. And they wondered, hey, this guy's different. The word of God came to John the Baptist. Maybe he's the one. And John doesn't want them to be under any false illusion. So he says, listen, yeah, I have a ministry. But my ministry is not near like the ministry of the Christ. I baptize you with water. But he who is coming, verse 16, 16 says, is mightier than I. He's so great that even though, as Jesus will declare later, John was the greatest prophet to ever exist, even though he's the greatest prophet to ever exist, John says in verse 16, I'm not even unworthy to bend down and take off his shoes and wash his feet. And that was the lowliest, most menial task a slave could do. And he says, that would be the highlight of my life. I'm not even worthy to do that. That's how great Jesus is. And then he says, when he comes, he's going to baptize you with Holy Spirit, with Holy Spirit, and with fire. He's going to inundate you, fill you with the Holy Spirit. That's part of the promise of the coming of the Christ, the King, the, the new age, the new kingdom, is the infilling of the Holy Spirit in all believers, and not just some selective few for temporary missions. All believers have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus brings that. You see that taking place on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But he says he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, some people see fire here as a good thing. And fire can be used as a good thing in the scripture because it purifies, like fire that's used to refine gold or metals. But I think the context better fits. He's, it's two options. Either you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and filled with God and changed because you surrendered and trusted in him and you repented of your sins, or you're going to be baptized with fire, and fire here probably represents judgment. And I think verse 17 bears out that interpretation, because it says in verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, and there's two options. And he's talking about people here, not agriculture. He can gather his wheat, those who repented and trusted in Christ, into his barn, the eternal kingdom, or you might need chaff, the un fruitful part, and he will burn that with unquenchable fire. So again, we have a mention of fire. Basically, he's saying, listen, you got two options, and there's only two options. There's not three, there's not four. You're either going to trust in Christ, commit your life to him, and be gathered to him, and experience his favor and blessings for eternity, or you're going to come under his judgment. And that's your only two options, and you need to make a decision for him. And then finally, verses 18 through 20, he says this, so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all. He locked up John in 
prison. Now this didn't happen the same time period. This happened a little bit time later, but he's putting, he's giving us a description of John that people listened to him. He brought them good news. See, repentance is good news. The fact that you can get right with God is good news. We're told that in verse 18. And many people listened to him, but there were also many who didn't. And one of those people was the powerful political leader, Herod, who was having, uh, who had uh, gained the system so he could end up sleeping with his uh, sister-in-law, you know, uh, his brother's wife, uh, and for many other evil things. He was a murderer, he was a philanderer, he was sexually immoral, he was a mess. And John the Baptist didn't just sit there and coddle him or ignore him. John the Baptist called him out, called him to repentance, just like he called the people to repentance. But John had that reaction of saying no, and rather he was violent and lock John up in prison. And that's really a good ending place for us today because that's choices you have. You can respond with joy to the good news of repentance and Jesus and the fact that God has made a way for us to have a healthy, blessed relationship with him even though we are sinners. You can respond to that with yielding and repenting and trusting. Or you can be like Herod and respond with anger and, and, and justify your sin and continue down the path of destruction. I hope you will choose the former. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for your multiplied mercies to us and the gift of repentance. We all mess up, Lord. Uh, we messed up in the past and we mess up today and we'll likely mess up tomorrow. But thank you that you allow us to turn around, that you call us to turn around. To And that's part of the good news that Jesus has made a way the King has made a way for us to have a right relationship with you despite our brokenness. Help us always to quickly repent, to never accept, to never condone, to never minimize our sin, but to turn to you in repentance and receive your favor instead of your judgment. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.